Dragon Ball GT. We got to see the adventures of Goku, Trunks, and Pan as they traveled throughout the universe. But what if this was inverted though? What if we instead got screen time with Goten and Vegeta? Possibly the most unexpected duo of our main characters a series could have thrown at us. How could the Prince of All Saiyans help his rival's second son improve? This story is created by Siblia, translated by Carl OS, and illustrated by Raguru. Support them using the links below. For a long time, the Dragon Balls had been allies to our friends for the protection of the Earth. But due to their immoderate use, the negative energy they contained rose without anybody noticing, until it manifested in the form of a dark dragon. All of the evil energy from the dragon gave birth to seven terrible beings, one for every Dragon Ball, each representing a different wish our heroes made, who began to wreak havoc on the planet, destroying villages, cities, and ending countless lives. But Goku would defeat them one by one. It almost seemed like our hero would easily breeze through all of them, until he faced the most powerful enemy he had ever encountered, the dragon of the One Star Ball. That sinister being would increase his power considerably by absorbing the other wish orbs. But even so, Goku defeated him and finished the battle which would not only decide the destiny of Earth, but the entire universe. After that, the Dragon Balls were gathered one final time, prompting Goku and Shenron to merge into a single being and disappear from this world. It's unknown what's become of the Saiyan after this, but it seems to be he's left the Earth for good. Meanwhile, there is something worrying Kami-sama, also known as Dende. Popo inquires the Guardian of Earth if there's something bothering him. And not exactly. He was only thinking of the appearance of these evil dragons. He remembered something the elders of his tribe told him on Namek. Many years ago, there was a time when Namek was victim of frequent and unexpected space pirate attacks. They destroyed everything in their path. Because of this, his people would often resort to using the Dragon Balls to patch things up. The weird thing is, that even if the Dragon Balls were used as much or even more times than they've been used on Earth, nobody has ever mentioned an evil dragon or his home planet being destroyed. Popo questions why he thinks that is. Though Dende has no idea, at this point, he can only hope that Goku's doing okay after disappearing with Shenron. After that fateful battle with the final Shadow Dragon, everyone met at Goku's house to celebrate his most recent victory. But at the time, all of them simply ignored the fact that this time, he would never come back. Everyone except one of them. Keeping up with his broody personality, Vegeta's isolated himself away from the others. He thinks to himself how foolish it was for Kakarot to fuse with that dragon. However, he is unable to keep himself from wondering if such an event managed to raise his power level at all. Unfortunately, looks like he'll never know. This leads him to wonder if there are any limits to them Saiyans. An ironic statement given how this story was written prior to Super's creation. If there are though, Vegeta knows he wants to see for himself. Now with his greatest rival taking his leave, he'll have to train with one of the boys. Quite the nuisance, but it'll still produce greater results in training alone. He calls out to his son. Not wasting any time after the downfall of Omega Shenron, he beckons if he's ready to start their training. But their training? Uh... When Mother Dearest decides to chime in and save the day, she apologizes for getting involved, but Trunks will have to be involved in the rebuilding of Capsule Corp. She won't be able to do it alone and he's too much of an asset to replace with anyone else. He then puts his focus in the direction of Gohan, who, personal relationships aside, is actually a much better candidate given his massive potential. He requests Goku's son come and train with him for a while, it would really help the both of them out. And while he'd love to, even if he doesn't see the necessity of it, even after just losing Goku and facing the most unthinkable threat the Earth has ever seen, but the company Warrior Works just called him and he has to assist with the rebuilding process too. Hearing the same excuse twice, surely there must be someone who can help rebuild instead of him. Why does it have to be Gohan specifically? The simple fact is, he's the one in charge. He has to be aware of everything going on, and it wouldn't set a very good example if he just hid in the shadows while everyone who reports to him did all the dirty work. He's sorry, but promises they can spar another time. Since the prince has never had a job in his life, he simply can't see eye to eye with the reasoning of these people. Though it would take a few minutes, he would eventually resort to talking to Goten. He chides he's the only one here who's not doing anything. Instead of wasting time, why not come train with him? But simultaneously, the great and supreme Vegeta can't believe he's resorted to praying for someone like him to help in this situation. 
How embarrassing. Who tries to boast if it were up to himself? For sure, no problem. But his mother wouldn't want to be left alone in such an emotional... When mother chimes in to quip her son not worry about her. He's neglected his training for a long time now. He needs to go with Vegeta. Secretly, this is merely a way for her to lure him away from that girl he has seen in Capital City. Valise or Palace if remembered correctly. This predictably throws Goten into a whirlwind. He makes an attempt to weasel out any way he can, but with nothing immediately coming to mind. Vegeta can't help but smirk to himself that it wasn't such a bad idea to talk to Chi Chi a few minutes ago after all, likely being the one to plant the seed of her reasoning in her head. He tells Goten he'll be waiting for him tomorrow at Capsule Corp. He better be ready. Leaving the young teenager to wonder what they've gotten him into. The next day, Goten was heading to the Capsule Corporation. He thinks to himself that Mr. Vegeta must be nuts. Why does he want to keep training? It's ridiculous to think there could be anyone more powerful than him and his dad. A Super Saiyan 4 transformation is simply unbeatable. He thinks this training will be nothing but a waste of time. All he really wants to do is spend the summer with Felice. Making his way... Well, technically inside. He bids Vegeta good morning and is ready to begin the training. The prince only grumbles that he's late and he had assumed he decided not to show. As the boy starts to explain how he overslept, his new mentor cuts him off to instruct he follow. Their spaceship is waiting. But what did he say? Why a spaceship if they can fly? Unless... Don't tell him! Confirming his dreadful suspicion, Vegeta plans to take him to an unoccupied planet. Did he really think Earth would be able to resist the impact of their training? The planet they're going to is pretty tough and isn't very far from here. If everything goes well, he expects they'll return in a year. Looking away from a student, Vegeta tries to remember where the spaceship even is in this mess. Naturally, a year is a bit more than Goten bargained for, especially if he is planning to keep his relationship with Felice alive. On the other side of the spectrum, the prince thinks a year sounds pretty great and warns the boy not to start complaining. He needs to hurry unless he wants to spend even more time off-world. Lucky for them. Or lucky for one of them. It looks like the hangar where the spaceship was located wasn't damaged by the Shadow Dragons. With this model, it should take them only a few hours to reach their destination. Unlike past iterations, which took forever to reach even Namek, for instance. Approaching a lever, Vegeta chuckles for his new training partner to say goodbye to this planet for a long time. Launching them into space. They're pretty much immediately out of eyeshot of the Earth. Goten has a question though. What are they going to eat? But that won't be an issue. Vegeta brought along a few food capsules from back at the warehouse. But capsule food? That stuff tastes horrible! Back at the lookout. Popo once again questions Dende, inquiring if he found something out. And he did. Even if it's only a very old myth. This catches the genie's curiosity as he requests him to elaborate. The story tells the origin of the Dragon Balls. A long time ago, on Namek, a native by the name of Askaru was resting when a divine being suddenly appeared to him. This person, this deity, told him that because of his heart, which was pure containing not a trace of evil, he would deliver unto him a great power. This power would go on to be passed down from generation to generation. After delivering this message, the divine being disappeared, leaving Eskaru with much doubt on how to use this power. That was until one day, he had a vision in his dreams that would help him create seven spheres that when brought together, would summon a dragon capable of granting any kind of wish. His assistant tries to assure him that's only a myth, as he said. Dende knows this. He doesn't think this has anything to do with the evil dragons. Although, he can't shake the fact that he has a bad feeling looming over him. With Goku disappearing atop of Shenron, and the Earth's Dragon Balls disappearing from existence, what possible misfortune could still be in store for our heroes as foreshadowed by Dende? And with Vegeta taking Goten to train, what adventures could the two of them find themselves in, juxtaposed to the trio of Goku, Trunks, and Pan? On a Mysterious World Goku, back in his adult form and looking just as good as ever. He lets out an enormous smile as he takes in the scenery around him. But how could this be? 
He disappeared from our dimension and became one with Shenron, didn't he? Joining the conversation already in progress, he asked his companion Frugo if he really means this entire planet will be his. It seems like a great place to train. It appears much more durable and vacant than the Earth. It seems whether alive, dead, or anywhere in between, some things never change. The magician dragon-looking individual to the Saiyan's left explains it's how he said earlier. Every god has his or her own planet, and this one is Goku's. He hopes he likes it because there aren't any others. While he's thinking about it, Goku thanks him for returning him to his normal height. To tell him the truth, he didn't mind being a kid for a while, but it feels a lot more comfortable training this way. Frugo modestly admits he does have certain abilities. Besides, he wouldn't be able to present a little child dwarf to the other gods. It would have been an offense to him. Big words for someone who stands shin height to Danny DeVito, but it is what it is. Goku questions where these gods are he speaks of, causing Frugo to demand he have more respect when talking about them. At the moment, they're all at the meeting place, the Divine Planet. But the Divine Planet? Looking up towards the sky, our hero begins to understand. The other 11 gods are waiting for him. Virgo already told him how he has to behave, so don't shame him and himself. Goku assures his new friend not to worry, he can take care of himself. The dragon only hopes that is indeed the case. When we get a view of their iteration of space, below we have the dragon planet, presumably the world where Goku is currently on. Above is the divine planet, a much larger celestial body. Those surrounding it are a total of 12 other worlds. We can likely assume they belong to other gods. While well, Goku is here in the divine dimension, one year would pass since Vegeta and Goten went to train on another planet. Get ready! I'm going to use all my power! Here I go! I'm ready! Damn it! I'm running out of energy! Impressively, Goten actually defeats Vegeta in the beam struggle. He rushes over to make sure his teacher's okay. As we see, the prince laments that he still can't control this transformation. This leads us to wonder if he stumbled onto Super Saiyan 3 all on his own in this story, or even makes us question if he can still access Super Saiyan 4. At least seeming to tone down his insufferable pride, he changes the subject to mention that he thinks it's been a year since they left the Earth. Who figured as much himself, but they can stay longer if he wants. To be honest, he never thought he could reach this level, and he'd like to see how much further he can go. Guess Goten has gotten a taste of his Saiyan side and is quick to embrace it. At this rate, the gap between him and Trunks will be unclosable in no time. Smirking at how much the kid's attitude's changed, it's decided. They'll stay here and continue to train a bit longer. Who knows what else they can accomplish, but it's clear they both still have room to grow. However, given their wiped state, Goten asks if they're done for the day. His mentor believes it'd be wise to call it quits for now. They'll be able to take each other even further if they let their energy recover. They can pick back up tomorrow. That's when Goten decides to point out that he didn't notice until now Vegeta's hair grew back out to normal, causing him to sigh that he doesn't know what he was thinking when he let his family cut it. Meanwhile, on the Dragon Planet. Appearing to be meditating. Frugo teleports in to alert the Saiyan that the other gods have been waiting for him. Turning around with a smile, he lost track of time and completely forgot about the meeting. When he begins to scream out in agony while holding his head. Virgo tries in vain to figure out what's going on with their hero. Then coming to a settle as quickly as it began. The lines around Goku's eyes become darkened and sinister. He mutters, free at last, before greeting Frugo. It's been so long. But it can't be! That voice! It belongs to! Jumping right in his face, he questions if he's afraid. He should be. This traitor will now see what he's capable of. Goku then steals what appears to be a small bag of senzu beans. Could this realm be where Korin first obtained them himself? Or are they possibly something else entirely? Now, go to sleep, 
trash! With Frugo, best case scenario unconscious. The possessed Goku figures he should get started at once. But started on what? What is this imposter planning? Whatever it is, he realizes he can't use his normal teleportation ability. But how complicated could the mortal's technique be? Feeling it out, he can sense a presence. And with ease, the villain is able to decipher it. He may not be able to freely teleport at will, but this is the next best thing. Although, whose energy has he locked onto? Whoever it is appears to be a Saiyan and recognizes Goku's face. He also takes notice of his tail. The man actually looks a bit like Gohan. He asks how he got here and if he'd like something to eat. Though the imposter could only curse to himself. How unremarkable the key is for all these mortal creatures. The stranger tells our foe hero that he doesn't know how much he's been looking for him. He shouldn't just stand there. Come in. He can make himself at home. But he isn't who he seeks and he's leaving now. Locking onto another presence, he can only hope this is who he's looking for this time. Pleading for Goku not to go, there's nothing he can do. However, for whatever reason, he did leave a piece of his clothing behind. With this, he should be able to track him down. He vows to Kakarot, he will find him. But who is this man, and what does he want with Goku? Away. Just as Vegeta goes to instruct Goten on the next part of their training, they both sense something. Alas, this still isn't where the fiend wanted to go. Goten calls out to him, asking his father what he's doing here. And why waste an opportunity? <laughs> Cheap shotting Goten. Whoever this is grows ecstatic that they're getting used to this body. When he feels another presence, could it be? It has to. That presence is the Namekian people, exactly who he's been searching for. And while it fooled Goten, Vegeta could tell clear as day that wasn't Kakarot's key. The young warrior gets himself back to his feet asking what's wrong with his dad. Why did he punch him? On Namek. The imposter shouts out that he's finally found him. He's been locked away for ages because of them. However, the modern day Namekians only recognize him as the man who defeated Frieza. As somebody resembling Mori approaches to warn everyone to be careful, this guy isn't who they think he is. He screams out what foolishness they're talking about. He only came here to kill them. Now you will pay for your insolence! Die! Rendering the village in ruins, he decides to take his leave. Though, he can feel a Namekian really far from here, so why not visit him as well? But could he possibly mean who we think he means? With Namek once again destroyed, Dende can see his premonition is already coming true. It started. And things only appear to be getting worse by the second. The invader presumes he must be the last Namekian. After him, there will be nobody of his kind remaining. Dendi questions the man who he is and why he's possessed Goku's body. But he implores he didn't possess him. He has fused with him. But what could this possibly mean? Is this monster Shenron? The Dark Dragon? Whoever it may be, he explains to Eris Guardian that he should actually be thanking him. After all, he is a descendant of the Dragon family. But it's necessary to kill him. He could end up being a nuisance otherwise. Popo warns them to be very careful. But the Namekian already knows what comes next. He tells Popo it was a real pleasure to share all this time with him. The villain raises his hand and shouts for him to die. Dende hits the ground and begins to fade from existence, much like Kami did before him. Making his way over to the edge, the invader's curious what lies below this platform. How many lives reside here? As we discover, Goku isn't being possessed, but this is rather the result of his most recent fusion. What other consequences will this bring? Who is in control? What do they want? Does Earth's greatest hero have any chance of fighting back? And finally, what about all the other gods on the Divine Planet? How will they play a part in restoring everything back to normal? The future is uncertain, 
Everything suggests that an evil entity has fused with Goku and destroyed planet Namek, together with all of its inhabitants. The entity itself showing no qualms against revealing this information to anyone he encounters. This vendetta has no known reason. Not even Dende could escape this terrible tragedy. Who could possibly wish to seek revenge against the Namekians, a race known for their peaceful and benevolent nature? Could there have been an event before the Great Cataclysm yet to be revealed? Or are his actions simply a means to an end in ridding the universe of the Dragon Balls, so his will cannot be undone? Meanwhile, the Earth's population, who lived in a long-standing time of peace before the appearance of the evil dragons, is oblivious to the potential threat which ominously watches, as they've been with the existence of the Dragon Balls and their creator that have saved them numerous times. However, this ignorance is likely going to be short-lived. The Earthlings don't know that the Namekian tragedy has occurred simultaneously with a universal tragedy, one which affects them in particular, as the fabled wish orbs which have brought hope for generations will never be accessible again. Because of that, our future grows only more hopeless. The events to come cannot be undone this time. However, not everything is lost. The planet still relies on warriors determined to defend it. While its greatest defender may be gone, a handful of formidable heroes still remain, including the reincarnation of Majin Buu, the greatest threat the universe has ever seen. Better yet, he's also Goku's lone protege. Then there's Goku's oldest son, the mighty hero who defeated the terrible monster known as Cell in the past, a warrior whose power and courage know no limits, Gohan. Stopping dead in his tracks, he can sense something's going on at the lookout. An evil key has just appeared out of nowhere, and he can no longer feel Dende's energy. Racing towards it, he worries this can't be! The unnamed villain continues his gaze at the world below the clouds. He grumbles that he hopes the stupid people of this planet are ready. Because soon they will know what true terror is. Making his way to the source of this strange key signature, Gohan can tell he's getting close. As an explosion erupts in the distance, this can't be happening! That city had just been rebuilt! The invader proudly stands amongst the debris and devastation he's caused. He scoffs at the fact that these pitiful insects here die so fast. They don't even last long enough to have a little fun with. Though. It's a good thing someone's approaching who seems to be a bit different than the rest of them. He should be a little entertaining. But why is he stopped? Initially, he was locked in a feverish pursuit. Alas, if he doesn't want to be the first to engage, the villain has no issue in chasing him down, unable to wait to see what this body can really do. Appearing in front of Gohan, the monster was right. This warrior is completely different than the rest. He's actually even more than expected. Maybe he will serve well to test his new power. Like Vegeta, Gohan isn't fooled by the Body Snatcher's appearance. This key, it's the same he felt before. He growls to know who this imposter is and what has he done with his father? The Fiend takes interest in the man before him being the son of Goku. That makes sense. He assures him not to worry. Himself and his father are a single being now, forever. In the headlights, Gohan pleads to himself that can't be. If this is true, his dad won't be able to. No, there must be a way. Maybe if they use the Namekian Dragon Balls to make a wish, that may be the only way to fix this. Snapping back to attention, he demands this fraud explain himself. What's he doing on Earth? Why did he kill Dende? He wants answers. His adversary inquires why he'd want to know. He didn't think a fighter of Gohan's stature would find any of these actions a big deal or anything. Besides, he himself only wants to fight him to test his strength, nothing personal. That is unless he'd like him to destroy another city. The Saiyan scowls, he won't get away with this. He will defeat him and get his father back. He will also avenge Dende. But Dende? Oh, he must mean that Namekian who lived on the sanctuary in the sky. He was a pitiful fool. He may as well have been one of the pathetic commoners from back on his home planet, the one he reduced to dust. Which means, the Namekian Dragon Balls have also. The monster smirks. He chuckles to Gohan he should have seen their stupid green faces.
After this remark, our heroes had enough. Those counterpart only taunts. That's it. Release all of your power. He thinks to himself, if he remembers correctly, this body could accumulate high levels of energy through some kind of transformation. If he focuses his energy, he should be able to do it. Effortlessly unlocking Goku's Super Saiyan 4 state, he cackles, this is great! He has become the most powerful being in existence. He screams for Gohan to get ready, because he's going to kill him. Who is a bit confused. While he is very powerful, he thought it'd be much stronger than this. Possibly hinting whoever's in control of Goku's body is having the same trouble as Ginyu did way back when. It may be only a matter of time before the fiend figures this out for himself and moves to correct this flaw. But as they say, ignorance is bliss. At the same time, in the realm of the Kais, Kabuto Kai and Old Kai kneel on the ground looking in on the situation through their crystal ball. The former questions his elder if he knows who this guy could be, and does he think Gohan can defeat him? But he doesn't have any idea who this new villain is. What he can tell him is that he possesses incredible power, but Gohan is not his lesser. They are both quite mighty. If there's any difference at all in their strength, it's pretty small. If Gohan plays a smart, there's a good chance he can win the upper hand. Although, in a battle of this scale, this is one situation when home field advantage is instead a massive hindrance. This leads the Supreme Kai to then ask how it is that Gohan had gotten himself to the same state, if not much more powerful, as he was when he fought Super Buu if he lost it. After all these years, it's pretty clear he hasn't been able to tap into the same strength he could when he is at his peak. But he never lost it. Okai explains that he unlocked the hidden power he had at the time. That way he could release it without the necessity to get angry or force it through transforming his body. This means Gohan's ultimate power isn't automatically fogged by blind fury, and his body isn't strained while trying to control the might of Super Saiyan. The state can't be lost, but it does require training like everything else, especially to control the entirety of his power which is constantly changing. It's like trying to slowly walk a giant boulder down a hill that's constantly gaining momentum, or attempting to run on a treadmill that keeps getting faster. This makes things a bit more clear for his successor, who continues to peer in on the situation like a child glued to the TV. For what he sees, the Elder believes that between the absence of Goku and what he recently experienced over the last few years, made Gohan start training again just in case a situation like this were to arise. Though, the fact he's facing his own father is undoubtedly not something he accounted for. He then stands, prompting the old-timer to inquire what he's doing. Surprisingly, he announces he's going to help Gohan. If there isn't a huge power difference between them, together, they should be able to beat him. Though he's instructed to wait, there's something his ancestor would like to tell him first. Giving him his full attention, Kibito Kai questions what it is. Does he want to give him advice for? But he only puts him in a headlock and screams to know what this moron is thinking. At the level these fighters are at, the number of fighters doesn't matter. If he goes, he will only serve to burden Gohan. What's more, he shouldn't go to help every time there's a problem. It's the mortals' duty to defend their own planet. They are the ones who live there. However, with the stakes on such a high scale, this may be a hill the old Kaioshin regrets standing on. So you finally decided to attack. <laughs> Come on! You're too slow! You disappoint me! Huh? This is for Dende! Catching him by surprise, the villain actually starts to laugh a bit after getting socked by Gohan. He even shouts out to him that that one actually hurt him. But even so, you will never win. The invader then realizes he's getting a taste of Saiyan biology. He doesn't know what's happening to him, but he's actually excited. Now it's my turn! Going back and forth, Kabuto Kai is impressed that neither one of them seemed to be giving any indication of yielding. His elder adds that they both decided to go all out with their power from the beginning. But at this rate, they'll rapidly get tired, so this battle will likely be decided by means of endurance. 
Regardless, the energy they're spending just hitting each other is incredible. The villain bellows he wasn't wrong. Gohan is very powerful, but he has to reiterate he will never be able to beat him. Our hero wonders if this guy is really this confident, or if he's just boasting. Oh, both warriors do appear winded. Meanwhile, on a faraway planet, an unknown person gazes into a smartphone looking device in amazement. It's astonishing how useful this thing is. With only a piece of his clothing, it's able to track down his location. Now he gets why the others are so excited in its value. What intrigues him, however, is the technique Kakarot used to get so far away in such little time. The Saiyan-like being from before, he figures once he finds who he's looking for, all of his questions will be answered. If we take a close look at him, there's something awfully familiar about his belt and boots. At any rate, he walks off to what is surely a Frieza Force attack ball. While he regrets this pod is pretty old, it doesn't matter right now. It's the only means of transportation he has. Besides, this should be the last time he'll ever have to use it. He boards the vessel and comments he has a long journey ahead of him. Hopefully, he'll be able to find a shortcut. But he can't contain his excitement. He can't believe he's going to meet Kakarot soon. The only time he ever got to lay eyes on him was when he was a newborn baby. His power level was so low that no one believed in him, even his own father. He himself was made responsible to raise Goku. But Frieza destroyed planet Vegeta just before he could find which planet he had been sent off to. However, when he had assumed he was as good as dead, fantastic news spread throughout the galaxy. Frieza had been defeated by a Saiyan. It was then he understood it was Kakarot's destiny to avenge the extinction of his people. He finally has the opportunity to see what kind of person he's become and witness his power firsthand. The stranger would have much loved to see his brother get to witness his son become the legendary Super Saiyan. This must mean that this man is Goku's uncle. It can be speculated that his power was so much lower than Bardock's. He was chosen to raise Goku instead of his own father, while Bardock himself went off conquering planets. Before he gets ahead of himself, it's time to leave. But not being well versed in the ship's technology, he just kind of button smashes before finding the launch control. Meanwhile, in a much more comfortable spaceship, Vegeta climbs up to the main deck of the Capsule Corp pod and asks if their coordinates to Earth are locked in. And given they're already blasting through the cosmos, Goten informs them they are. He then comments that Vegeta looks really excited, but does he think he can beat him without transforming into a Super Saiyan 4, prompting the prince to sniff for a student to shut up. The boy reminds Vegeta that he doesn't have a tail, and even if the conditions of the planet they were just training on helped him reach Super Saiyan 3, they still can't control that transformation. And. Again insisting he shut up, Vegeta knows. He also knows he'll have to rely on that machine again. He takes a seat to make a long distance call. But a call? They can call people? Why didn't he ever tell Goten? And it's because he never asked. So this entire time he could have kept in touch with Valise. She's probably already forgotten about him by now. Naturally, Vegeta uses their communication system to call Bulma, who questions where he is. After explaining the two of them were on their way back to Earth, he inquires if they spotted Kakarot by chance. Though she's only bewildered to what he's talking about, nobody's seen him since the incident with the Dragon Balls. However, at the moment, there is some evil guy fighting against Gohan. He then tells her to get the Bloodswave Generator to Gohan. He himself is heading that way and will be joining him as soon as possible. She agrees, but the only issue is she has to charge it first. Once that's done, she'll get it there. Still not one to talk more than necessary, the prince bids her goodbye. Trunks asks if that was his father, and if so, if he's on his way back. Bulma fills her son in on the situation. Trunks instructs Pan to stay here and wait for the machine. He's going to help Gohan in the meantime. Though the young girl at first has an objection to this, she decides to muffle her words, merely muttering, okay. Pressing her son to be careful, Trunks promises he will be. Akame House. A news anchor elaborates they're showing again the last images of the most recent tragedy. Their team was broadcasting live from the East Capitol when a huge explosion of unknown origin reduced the city to rubble. We are here in the East Capitol where the- Hey look! What's that? Uh, 
on the other side of the TV. Krillin questions Roshi, wasn't that Goku? Who ominously remarks, he thought they would have more time. Asking what he's talking about, the old timer explains that until now, he hadn't paid much attention to the scriptures of the old masters because he didn't get the meaning of their words. But with all this happening, he can see it all much clearer. The one who's fighting to the death with Gohan at this very moment is indeed Goku. But that can't be! There's no way! He must be wrong! It was Roshi himself who said it had to be an evil being. Though that is true. Simply put, Goku is not the same anymore. Of course, this just leads to more questions. The Turtle Herman instructs Krillin to pay close attention. The story he's going to tell him was taught to him by his own master, Master Mutaito. He told him that ages ago, there were some wise men who discovered the mystery about key control and who were the owners of some mystical powers, like the ability to see the future. They had many visions about the coming days, prophecies which they wrote in verse. One that comes to his mind reads as follows. The time is up. Fear the king from the sky with new face and strength. The being new body will adopt. In less than a wink, the city of sun will disappear. When the dragon to its end comes, the apostate its reign will begin. Crying, death, destruction. Matchless horror will impose those who before, with conviction, against the evil fought. He had never thought these words could be referring to Goku. It wouldn't be a bad idea to take a look at the Mashal Mabal, the book where these prophecies are written. Krillin can't deny that this does sound a whole lot like it's describing Goku, but couldn't it just be a coincidence? Roshi believes it to be too exact to be simple chance. He actually no longer carries any doubt about it. Their current enemy can't be compared with any they've ever faced before. Now they can only wait for a new savior. Die! Gohan! Endara boy! Reinforcements are on the way! I don't feel his energy. I think I already killed him. Looking for me? Gah! Sending Goku careening into the ground. Gohan meets him there shortly after. He explains how he managed to avoid his attack an instant before the explosion. The villain chuckles. He never imagined that, during all his time in prison, people with huge powers like his could have appeared. But he wants him to know, up until this point, he's only been having fun. The outcome is already decided, so there's no need for him to take this seriously. Gohan objects that if this were true, the Fiend wouldn't be fighting with all his power. Though his other retorts, it's not that. But for what he sees, the two of them have almost the same power. However, he's not worried about it. Because in the end, one of them will have to yield, and that will be Gohan. Who scoffs he shouldn't be so confident? Neither one of them have much energy left. This is still anyone's game. Ending this endless loop of a conversation, the imposter quips he doesn't care what he thinks. He'll understand when he's about to die. By the way, there's a technique he'd like to use that he believes has a lot of potential, so he wants to test it out. With a familiar form, we all know what's coming next. The cadences of Goku's signature attack echo through the wasteland. To Gohan, it's not so much that the villain's using this attack, but Gohan wonders if he's planning on putting the remainder of his energy into it. As the battle between evil Goku and Gohan reaches its apex, will the latter be able to hold out long enough for at least Trunks to arrive? And with Vegeta able to use the Bloodswave Generator to rival Goku's Super Saiyan 4, what other tricks does this monster have up his sleeve? As the imposter charges up Goku's Kamehameha, Gohan pleads for him not to do it. If he performs that attack with such excessive power, he will completely destroy the Earth. But the villain only snarls that he sees his opponent recognizes the destructive power of this technique. However, he doesn't care at all what happens to this planet. It's not even a problem for him as he can just teleport himself elsewhere instantly. But Gohan, on the other hand, our hero knows he's right. But if his adversary fails, he'll run out of energy if he plans on putting all his power into this attack. Why would he risk so much? Gohan wanted to resolve this battle with punches and kicks to preserve the earth and cities as much as possible. He didn't think he would get to this point. Now he has to do something to prevent this blast from destroying the earth. Darting into the air, Gohan shouts to get his attention. His foe arrogantly believes this to be merely a feeble attempt to flee and run away. 
It's really a way to pull a page from Tien, but really Krillin, and blind him with a solar flare. It works like a charm and the invader holds his eyes in agony. Able to stop the world ending Kamehameha for now. The entity picks himself up from the rubble while grumbling this little game is over. Reaching into his belt, he pulls out a Senzu, proving the bag he took from Frugo is what we assumed it to be after all. Gohan stares on in horror, wondering how this could be possible. The situation may have just become insurmountable. These most recent happenings aren't lost on the approaching trunks either. The evil key is increasing while Gohan's has gotten immensely weaker. Now back in perfect shape, Bo Goku comments he's feeling pretty good. The half Saiyan puts two and two together and sees this is why he was so confident. His other chuckles if he sees now. He wasn't lying when he said he was going to kill him. Though Gohan isn't impressed. He calls the man a coward while asking where he got that sensu from anyway. It's been a long time since anyone cultivated those things here. But he only questions what he's talking about. These beings only exist in the realm where he comes from. What? Which seems to finally cue off Old Kai about the villain's identity. With Kabito Kai asking what the outburst is about, he asks his successor if he remembers being told that all the Kaioshins of his generation, the ones who fought against Majin Buu, went to the Earth and cultivated some magic beans that already existed on this planet. Taking a second to remember, this seems to ring a bell. Well, those beans have a special origin. They have existed since before this world came into existence, before any of the Kaioshins came into existence. The story claims that those beans were a present from beings who came from a world superior to themselves, given to the first generation of Supreme Kais. But. No one knows exactly where the world these ancient beings came from. What's more, in his years of existence, he has never heard anything else about them. The thing is, he who is in Goku's body has those beings, and from what he said, he's pretty sure he comes from the same place as the ancient ones. The old Kai very much so believes they're in the presence of a superior being, superior to the Supreme Kais, maybe even the creator of all the worlds in existence. Arriving, Trunks does his best to diligently scope out the situation before getting too close. He wonders why Goku of all people is radiating such wicked energy. On the battlefield, Gohan can only wonder what on earth is Trunks doing here? What could he be thinking? The imposter takes notice of the additional warrior, but he can already tell he's too weak to deserve his attention. Trunks touches down and asks Gohan if he's okay, and what's the matter with Goku? Gohan assures he's fine and it seems that someone has possessed his father's body. But he doesn't know for what purpose, not yet at least. The only thing that he does know is that he's recovered his full power. There's not much he can do to stop him. His ally tells him not to worry. His dad and Goten shouldn't take much longer to get here, and Pan is going to bring the Bloodswave Generator. But Pan? Pan is coming here? Tone deaf, Trunks confirms his fears. She should be on her way at this very moment. Gohan then scolds it would be better if Trunks were to leave, and by no means let Pan get anywhere near here. It's way too dangerous. That guy has no mercy for anyone. However, the son of Vegeta refuses to leave his friend alone in this situation, not in the battle-worn state he's in, who admits it's actually even worse than he thinks. If anyone dies, they won't be able to be revived. If he hasn't noticed, Dende is dead, and Namek has been destroyed. But both! That means the Dragon Balls too. The villain has had enough of the talking. The killing starts now. After launching the battered Gohan into the dirt, he turns his sights onto Trunks, who's transformed into a Super Saiyan. He taunts for him not to make him laugh. Does he really plan on attacking him with such a pitiful power? You're only annoying me! Using the force of his energy alone, it proves enough to take out the Half Saiyan. The villain states that he's beginning to think he got too excited in coming here. There's nothing for him to do on this planet anymore. In fact, he thinks it's time for him to reclaim his throne. But before he does that, he'll put this miserable world out of its misery. 
He does have to admit to himself that this fight wasn't all in vain. Now at least he knows his own power. And if it wasn't from those beans he stole from Frugo, he may have actually lost his battle. But how did he know about the Senzu? Picking himself up, the villain's surprised to see Gohan still has some strength left. Still, he can't waste any more time here. He will just have to die along with his planet. Our hero knows he can't give up. He's currently the final line of defense for the Earth. He has one last ditch effort to protect his home. As his adversary charges his apocalyptic attack, Gohan knows this is it. That ball will have the energy to obliterate everything in its path. He can't dodge it. He must fend it off. Bogoku laughs to himself, thinking all his foe has to do is touch this blast, and he will die instantly. But back with our protagonist. Something's wrong. His arms aren't responding. Still conscious, Trunks groggily focuses his eyes to see what's going on. He tries to figure out what he's doing. Why is he waiting to do something about that attack? On the inside, he knows he doesn't have the energy to divert it. The only choice he has left is to take it directly head on. He doesn't think his body will be able to resist it. But in any case, whatever happens, it's what his father would have also done seeing the Earth in danger, just like at the end of the Cell games. It doesn't take long for Trunks to understand what's happening. He understands his ally's reasoning. Gohan doesn't have enough strength to reject that blast anymore. He's planning on stopping it using only his body. But in his current condition, it'll more likely than not kill him. This revelation causes an inner crisis for the young fighter. Gohan is so willing to put everything on the line and sacrifice himself for the planet. But himself, on the other hand, he screams for his dad to hurry up and get here! While trembling, he knows Gohan must not die. He and his father are the only ones who can fight against this guy as equals. He doesn't want to admit it to himself as a warrior, but for some time he's been neglecting his training. He was under the belief that if any problem appeared, there would always be someone stronger than himself to resolve it. But now, he's alone, and everything is up to him. It's a pity the Dragon Balls don't exist anymore, but he's not afraid. He'll die peacefully, because it'll not only save the Earth, but Gohan as well. In fact, it's a great honor. Go! Go on! <laughs> Shoving Gohan out of the way, Trunks takes the death blow to save the Earth's greatest hope. However, the weary warrior only falls to his knees, asking why Trunks did that. Looking upward, he shouts that wasn't an energy blast at all. It was all a trap. And that's true. That technique actually doesn't cause any damage. It destroys the insides of whatever body it touches. It wouldn't have had any effect on this planet, but he realized it too late. Meaning, Trunks quite literally may have died for nothing. When a childlike voice calls out for Trunks off screen, could it be Pan? Sure enough, Gohan's daughter has made her way to the battlefield. She senses Trunks' key. Approaching, she cries for him to get up. After so many adventures together, Arguably, Pan's best friend is the first to fall in a world without the Dragon Balls to put everything back to normal. While the young girl mourns this loss, what others are yet to come? Still sobbing the loss of Trunks and remembering all the good times they've had over the last few years. Pan beckons, why? Why did he do this? Her father pleads for her to stop knowing what she's about to do. Launching after the villain. She realizes, it's her grandfather. But this doesn't make any sense. Why would he? Before she can even finish the sentence, he reaches out growling that she's quite a nuisance. But he loves to see people suffer. Grabbing her at the neck, Gohan knows that's now or never. If he doesn't do anything, Pan is going to be joining Trunks. Feebly rushing to save his daughter, his adversary smiles at his stubbornness. 
Accept it! You've lost! Now grabbing him by the throat. The imposter would like to give him some advice. There is no point in fighting for other people. People are ungrateful. And they will all, eventually, end up turning their back on you either way. Tossing our hero to the ground, he claims he will now destroy this planet. When he's hit by someone from behind, but who attacked him? In a shocker, not Goten or Vegeta, but 17. He comments that Goku's changed a lot since he last saw him. Piccolo's here as well. Fresh out of hell, Halo and all. Relief washes over Gohan seeing his mentor again for the first time in a long while. He tells his friend, equally happy to see him, to rest for now. We see a Halo over 17 too, signifying he wasn't resurrected after the Shadow Dragon arc, as was stated in Perfect File Volume 2, but either chose to stay in Otherworld, or Shenron did not deem him worthy of revival given how the wish was stated. He instructs Piccolo to also take the girl, referring to Pan. The evildoer takes particular interest in 17. Why couldn't he feel his key when he attacked just now, naturally not knowing he's a cyborg? Who the Namekian informs he's gotten them both to a safe place? Where and how is a mystery, though the android puts his focus on what they should do next. At the Otherworld check-in station, Yama lets out a sigh of relief that the pair arrived just in time. After that little Majin Buu incident, he needs to be a little more cautious with the souls he sends to hell, which could refer to the millions of lives lost, or warriors like Vegeta who sacrificed themselves for the greater good, but still lived largely sinister lives. The imposter notices their halos, which clearly means they're dead, so they shouldn't be here. Could it be that? There's a couple more feet tap down. Things are looking better than ever for our heroes. Goten and Vegeta have arrived. The villain looks in their general direction, but these two, he knows them from somewhere. Getting a closer look, that's right, he recognizes them from that planet he accidentally teleported to. Ignoring these comments, Vegeta questions the others if they know anything about this guy. Alas, they don't. Just about the same he's already aware of. He and Seventeen arrived to find Gohan and Pan injured badly. So in that case, the prince figures they'll just have to make him talk. But beforehand, Piccolo mentions he has something Pan brought. She told him to give it to him. Inside this capsule is the Bloodswave Generator. Though, the Saiyan figured it would be his son who's going to bring it. In his absence, it seems he has completely abandoned fighting, completely ignorant to the fact he perished just moments before his arrival. Like Pan, Jita has a series of memories flash back to him as well, but not pleasant ones in particular. Ever since they met, Kakarot has always been able to best him in one way or another. Whether with his friends or a little bit of luck when he and Nappa first arrived on Earth, or secretly holding back his Super Saiyan 3 transformation when Bobbity attacked. He calls out the imposter asking who he is and why he looks like Kakarot. It's obvious he's only a cheap imitation, so spill it. Is he a clone? A body thief? A long-lost twin? His opposite condescendingly beckons who he thinks he is talking to him like that. He is far superior to any of those claims, so the Saiyan better not try to get smart with him. Actually, he should kill Vegeta right now for his insolence. Though since he did travel all the way here just to see him, and because he loves to witness suffering of inferior beings firsthand, he will generously postpone the destruction of this feeble planet and give this challenger a chance. The villain is willing to tell them all about himself, who he is, where he came from, and most of all, why he merged with Goku. That is, of course, if they can somehow defeat him. Smirking and clicking the capsule, Vegeta's happy to hear such an easy request. With the generator in hand, he tells Piccolo to aim it at him and fire. Although he never had the opportunity to see what this machine does previously, the Namekian assumes this device will increase his power, so he complies without hesitation. Vegeta elaborates that when Kakarot left with the dragon, he thought he'd never see him again. He seemed so sure of what he was doing that he himself never expected him to end up in this kind of situation. As much as he has his doubts, he only hopes that this pale fraud's fusion with him doesn't disappoint and at least gives him a good fight. So, 
All he has to do is win, and he'll get to talking. Sounds fair. The prince is actually very curious as to how all of this transpired. In return, Nakoku doesn't think this new foe will be able to satisfy his own curiosity. This form is nothing new. Having used it in battle himself, he believes he's already aware of all it has to offer. Worst case scenario, he imagines the two of them may be equal, but even in the event of a stalemate, he himself will walk to the finish line in his victory. Given the terrain they're on, he doesn't have a chance, though so he's welcome to give it all he's got. Don't mock me! So quick to anger. Incredible. Both have really impressive power. I don't think the Earth is the best place to do this. Elsewhere. Kibitokai pleads for his ancestor's approval to offer his assistance. If he allows him to go to Earth and heal Gohan, victory is assured. The Earth will be saved and this battle will come to an end. Who argues there is no point? Cheetah is too prideful. He will never let anyone interfere in this fight, even if it means failure. But the whole universe could be in danger! Again, all reasonable logic is thrown out the window. In this moment, the universe is what matters least to the Saiyan. They could give Vegeta a magical button that could erase that imposter from time and space. He would throw it right back in their faces in disgust. For what old Kai sees, he had arrived before Goku had eaten that senzu bean. He would have had a little advantage in this battle, but now their power is the same. The trust in Vegeta is the only thing they have left. While his pride handicaps him in many capacities, it is also what's made him a genius in one-on-one -on -one battle. After taking a haymaker from Vegeta, considering his fight with Gohan, the monster begins to understand that Goku studies his foes first, and his body has already gotten used to fighting in such a way. Vegeta mockingly calls him out to ask what happened. What's with that worried look on his face? Who doesn't really have much of a comeback in response? You're going to die! Getting even, Naku mutters to himself that he told Vegeta he would never defeat him. But Goten doesn't get it. He and Vegeta have been training nonstop, but he's no stronger than he was a year ago. Why isn't he showing any improvement? That insult to injury. 17 adds that Goku definitely seems weaker than when the two of them fought. Even with himself being brainwashed, and Goku being in his child form outside Super Saiyan 4, he's sure of it. Vegeta himself tries to make sense of what's going on. He trained like never before and his power hasn't increased at all. Has he really reached his limit? That moron isn't even as good as he was a year ago. But here they are. How disappointing. He's not even capable of defeating a copy of Kakarot. Is this his fate? To always play second fiddle to that clown. What does he have to do to finally surpass him? His aggressor so helpfully recommends he fight better. He's seen how Vegeta and the others have relied on the Dragon Balls far too much over the last few decades. They've grown so accustomed to them being their end-all backup plan to bail him out. But now, with all the Namekians dead and the power of the balls in his hand, if Vegeta dies, he will never come back to life. Just like that pathetic purple-haired boy. A purple-haired boy? That's when he realizes he can't sense Trunks' key. The villain sadistically remarks that he should have seen him. He squirmed like a helpless rat. My Trunks! As the death of his son is heartlessly revealed, what is this new form Vegeta's obtained? Could it be the power hidden away from his training with Goten? Or has he really reached a ceiling? And this is merely his love for his family finally breaking through.
taking the upper hand by miles. Piccolo states that Vegeta now possesses an incredible amount of power. There's no way he can lose this fight. While that may be, Seventeen points out that if things continue as they are, he's going to kill his opponent before they can find a way to recover Goku's body. Right now, they can only hope Vegeta retains control of his emotions and doesn't let his hastiness do anything he'll regret. At least, until they get that guy talking. The villain sits on the ground furious at this turn of events. This can't be possible! Goku is supposed to be the most powerful being in existence! Worst of all, he now can't leave this planet without destroying it first. It could become a great bother otherwise. He let his ego control his actions, and now knows he should have done it when he had the chance. Vegeta quips that the body snatcher here said he'd start talking if they defeated him. Does he want to do that now, or should he keep hitting him? Damn it! The evil doer has become totally inept in this battle, but there's still one thing left he hasn't tried. He screams out to the Earth's Guardian that he's done playing around and will destroy this world once and for all. He screams at above him, it's the entirety of his own vital energy. After it touches down, there won't be a trace of anyone left. You're all going to die! The imposter admits Vegeta is more powerful than himself. Something he truly doesn't want to confess. But even this new form won't be enough to stop this attack. Piccolo shouts he's not bluffing. Vegeta's power isn't enough to stop this blast. The Earth will be destroyed! As the prince fends off this apocalyptic energy, the entire Earth begins to tremble. From Roshi and Krillin to Chaozu and Tien, the latter fearing the planet won't be able to resist much more. Even the Kais believe it appears that Vegeta's starting to yield. It's over! But as we finally get first-hand information, what everybody's afraid of does have merit. Vegeta expected more from this transformation. He's at his limit and his arms are going to give out at any second. If he's going to save anyone, he'll have to take the entirety of this blast himself. Everyone here, including the other Z-Fighters, will die as a result, but the Earth will remain. There's no other choice. When it remembers, Trunks. <laughs> Deflecting the attack, the villain can't believe this! Now he's left with no energy at all. Looking on, the others cheer that he's done it. Now they can make that guy talk and find a way to recover Goku. While the others look on in excitement, Piccolo appears almost terrified that Vegito is able to fend off so much key. Our hero snarls his foe is done. That technique left him completely drained. Now he'd be lucky to even find the strength to get himself back on both feet. Kakarot would have never been such a fool to try that in a fight. As the imposter attempts to flee using a transmission, Vegeta stops him before breaking his arm. Goten pleads that's enough. If he kills him, they'll never know how to get his father back. Piccolo chimes that last attack was as powerful as a spirit bomb, but now he's out of key. It's very curious why he would risk so much. Contrary to the prince's previous statement, the fraud manages to hold himself up. But only for a moment. Vegeta questions if he'll talk now. If he beats him down one more time, he'll probably die, and he's mistaken if he thinks he wouldn't try it. His adversary relents, only requesting he give him a moment to gather himself. The Kais celebrate in this unexpected turn. Kibito Kai admits to his elder he was right. The mortals can solve their own problems after all. With an I told you so look, since old Kai was right, he figures at least his successor can do is go get him some coffee. Unaware of the fact that the villain still has two senzu beans, he may not be able to beat him, but he might be able to buy just enough time to escape. 
growing a sinister grin. He tells Vegeta he will tell him everything he wants, but only after eating this bean. Piccolo Bello is exactly what the imposter is planning. He only intends to recover his strength and run away. Though our hero doesn't care. Even at full power, he won't be able to get away. It'll only extend his agony. As their worst nightmare crunches down on yet another Senzu, the Namekian knows he's making a huge mistake. <laughs> Meanwhile, off planet, Goku's uncle senses a giant energy coming from the direction he's heading. It's incredible he can feel it from here, but what could be happening there? Either way, He's just excited to finally get to meet the most powerful warrior in the universe, who simultaneously gazes upon his newfound power. The Senzu acted as enough of a Zenkai boost to transcend him to the same heights as Vegeta. He glances over to Piccolo to taunt he was right. He was planning to run away, but now he's not leaving without destroying this planet first. The Namekian curses Vegeta has yet again let his pride doom them all. His excessive confidence has put the Earth in immense danger. Without skipping a beat or recognizing how the situation has changed, Vegeta states that now that he's eaten his little bean, he demands to know who he is and what his intentions are. His adversary insists he calm himself. He's no longer in a position to talk to him like that. What's more, to explain everything would take all day, and he doesn't feel like wasting any more time here. Figuring fair enough. Prince then simply inquires why he chose Kakara specifically to fuse with. The imposter decides he can at least give him this one thing, and if he's being honest, he claims he doesn't need Goku to achieve his goals. But around one year ago, he saw his chance to fuse with him and took it. But he wants to finish this at once. He wants his revenge to consolidate the humiliation he suffered over the last few minutes. <sighs> In a surprise twist, our hero informs that's a pity. If that's what he desires, he will surely be left with a void to fill, as he doesn't intend to continue this fight. After his foe implores him to elaborate, our protagonist has simply lost interest in this battle, causing the villain to cackle out with laughter. He knew it fear him now after his most recent transformation. In that case, he will proceed with the destruction of this miserable planet. Vegeta scoffs for him to think whatever he wants to. But this battle isn't over yet. Another will fight in his place. But another? Those other three are nothing but scum. The prince only smiles. There are many things this fraud still doesn't know. However, even Piccolo feverishly wonders what on earth his ally could be up to. Why doesn't he himself want to fight? That's when the Saiyan contacts Goten via telepathy, telling him to listen carefully. Who asks the same question that's on everyone's mind. Why doesn't he want to fight him anymore? Is it that he can't defeat him? He tells how everything points to Kakarot's power having diminished in this fusion. That's why his own power overwhelms him so much. The truth is, he can easily defeat this fake. Because of this, there is nothing which motivates him to keep going with this fight. But how could he say that? This guy plans to destroy the Earth, and he isn't going to do anything to stop him? Though it's because of these reasons, he wants Goten to fight him instead. Who wonders why him? That's impossible. He isn't even close to being on his level. Vegeta snips that he'll cut off his tail, but to do that, he needs Goten to distract him for a moment. He's going to have to completely lower his guard to do it. Once his tail's removed, he will not be able to access this transformation or Super Saiyan 4, so Goten will be able to take him on. He must attack when he gives a signal. This plan's starting to make a bit of sense to the young warrior, but even tailless, he can still go Super Saiyan 3. Vegeta argues if he does, and he surely will. Goten still has the power to beat him. This is not Kakarot. It's only a phony who doesn't know how to use his father's strength. After they pull this off, he tells Goten he'll be on the sidelines for this battle, but he refuses to fight a shadow, a shell of what Kakarot truly is. Getting pumped up, Goten's ready to do this. With a new plan to put an end to this battle once and for all, will Vegeta's apathy once again be the undoing of our heroes? Or will Goten truly be the one to put an end to the imposter's reign? As the villain yells out if he plans to just stand there and do nothing, Vegeta instructs Goten to attack. You're going to fight me. That attack is easily deflected. That's right, fool. Just touch it. Good. Now's the perfect chance. 
just as he gets a hold of his foe's tail. Vegeta realizes something about that ball of energy. Why doesn't it? Go, Jared! Don't touch it! What was that? And foiled. Neither one of them were on the battlefield to see Trunks fall to that very same move. While saving Goten's life, Vegeta has in turn lost his own tail and possibly his consciousness. Not only that, but their enemy now sees what their plan was, which reveals to him the key to this transformation. He'll have to be more careful about protecting his tail in the future. The frustrated Goten wonders where the heck Trunks is, and why is he so slow in getting here? If they could fuse, they might actually have a chance in standing up to this guy. When Piccolo informs he's not coming, that guy already killed him. But Trunks, he's dead? Back at the battle, the fake Saiyan chuckles that he knew that attack wouldn't trick him. Turns out it was a good decision not to use it against him after all. Regardless, it's like he said at the very start of the fight. None of them will ever defeat him. Reaching out his arm, he tells Vegeta to die. Stupid. He snarls Goten's time will come soon enough. For now. He's going to do away with that moron. But where'd he go? And who is that new warrior next to the others? Carrying Vegeta away from certain doom, Oob! With Goten and Vegeta out of commission, has the reincarnation and ultimate refusion of Majin Buu done anything to improve his abilities since the last time we saw him fight in Dragon Ball GT? Can he do anything against the imposter who wears his master's face? Or is this all simply a waste of time? In other world, Grand Kai jams out as per usual, but is regretful to inform North Kai he's never heard a thing about the origin of the Dragon Balls. Disappointed, Kaiosama thanks him for his valuable time regardless. He'll have to simply watch how the battle unfolds from here. But what's happened? He only looked away for a second! Why is Vegeta's key plummeted to the ground? Who points out that Goten is also unconscious? He politely requests that Piccolo get him to a safer place, along with Vegeta. Also, does he know why Master Goku is beaming with this evil key? Of course, all they know is that their old friend fused with an evil beam. Now his only goal is to destroy the Earth, taking it in. It appears Piccolo's secret hiding place for everyone is simply taking them slightly off the battlefield. He can respect what Vegeta was planning, but someone even much less clever than him could have still imagined their foe had a technique or two up a sleeve. It was foolish for him to risk so much. It must have been hard for him to have all that power, but be unable to bring himself to avenge Trunks. Perhaps it's better this way. But now they can only hope that the years of training Uba's undergone will pay off. Goku has prepared him specifically for this kind of situation, even if no one else ever guessed things would turn out this way. Facing off against the Super Saiyan 5, Goob hopes King Kai can figure out a solution for them all soon. Does this mean he's been in communication with them? The villain grows annoyed in having to fight yet another warrior, but... Asking if he's ready, the Pseudo Saiyan can't help but get a little excited. Gah! You're no match for me! Did that punch really hurt me that bad? You're trash! Wow, Oob is really fast. But does he have the strength to match him? Back with the deities, Kabito Kai delivers the coffee as requested by his ancestor. But unbeknownst to him, much has changed since he left to get it. Why did it take him so long? If it wasn't for Ubin Goten, Vegeta would already be dead! <laughs> the 
though Ooh matches up surprisingly well against the Super Saiyan 5, even if the latter doesn't have the full power that Goku would have in this state. Our hero sees right through this and questions why his opponent isn't fighting seriously. What's the matter with him? Is he injured or something, or is he simply not taking him seriously? And he claims it's just that. He doesn't need to use his full power to win this fight. He may as well have a little bit more fun before killing them all and leaving here. Of course, he actually is injured. That blow from Goten is hindering his movements. Oob just finds all of this really strange. It's true that he's not using all of his strength, but his moves are extremely predictable. If his transformation is the same as Vegeta's, why are his attacks at such different speeds and accuracy? Even if he isn't taking him seriously, his technique is incredibly sloppy. That is unless he misjudged Vegeta's own moves. Sensing something out. He believes he's got it. Hitting him with some kind of blast. The evildoer isn't phased. Actually, his abdomen feels completely better. What has Oob done? Going full Goku, the young fighter explains how he has healed him. Now they'll be able to battle without that nuisance. He doesn't want to have any advantage in this fight. Naturally, his foe looks on in shock that not only does this earthling possess such an ability, but that it'd actually be stupid enough to aid him with it. Could this be some kind of trick? As something becomes apparent to him, he can't believe he didn't notice it sooner. The aura of this kid reveals without a doubt some kind of union of the bodies. Maybe he found a way to merge with another Namekian of this world. Whatever the other being was, he's going to find out. The Fiend plans to defuse them and see who he's hiding within that body. Since it's only a spell rather than a key based technique, it shouldn't be too much of a problem pulling it off with Goku's body. He's going to regret underestimating him. As the fusion of Oob and Majin Buu is undone, they can back in time to the day that Goku took his new pupil off to train. As they travel, the boy meekly requests that before they go back to his village, if they could stop to do a little fishing. He promised his family he'd bring him back something to eat. Lucky for him, Goku isn't someone you have to ask twice about food. He's happy to take a little break to get them some dinner. Thanking him, young warrior has no idea what the near future holds for him. Our hero tells him to hang on tight. A bit of time would pass, at first seeming to mirror some training he himself did with Master Roshi. Goku corrects his pupil that he's only hitting the boulder with a lot of his strength. That's not how he's going to complete this exercise. But how can he break a rock with only two fingers? That's all he's allowed to use, right? Alas, he'll see that physical strength isn't what matters. The control of Ki is their goal. But for him to utilize it to its fullest, his mind has to be calmed. Moving a position to give him a demonstration, Goku tells him to keep an eye on the small details. and splitting it in half by barely even touching it. His student is amazed. Motioning for him to follow suit. It's unknown how many attempts or days it would take him to manage such a feat himself, but the pair would train day and night. Not a single evening would pass where Oop didn't learn something new. As more time passed, Goku even snuck him into Otherworld to test his skills against the greatest heroes of history. It would be Oob and Pycon in the finals, where they both appeared quite evenly matched. And Kai has to hand it to Goku. Oob has improved a lot in the mere two years they've been training. He's a very rapid learner. With a familiar bodily motion, we know what Pycon plans next. Goku worries that a student doesn't know this technique. And if it hits, his body won't be able to resist it. Thunder Flash Attack! But they won't have to find out. The boulder training coming full circle. Who manages to get behind his opponent to deliver the finishing blow. The announcer crescendos that subtle hit seems to have seriously damaged competitor Pycon. Before the countdown can even begin, Oob confidently informs the official that while he won't be seriously hurt, his foe will be unconscious for a few hours. And in that case, the warrior from Earth is crowned the winner! Even Goku is impressed with this outcome. Not only is that hit extremely difficult to connect with, but it's even more difficult not to kill your opponent by getting its power off. 
What's more, Oob didn't so much as need to see that attack twice to find its weak spot, which is a cheeky knock at Goku. Hinkai thinks that Oob will surely surpass Goku one day. What an amazing pupil to have chosen for a successor. But unfortunately, a lot has changed since his training. While Oob may be immensely powerful aside from his fusion with Boo, will he be enough to take on this iteration of his teacher? Will his natural battle IQ be able to adapt and save his home? Or is the Earth doomed to fall to its greatest savior? Now two entities, Oob is able to at least instantly realize what's happened. Piccolo's aghast to how this could be. How did this fiend undo their fusion? Not even deities have the ability to do something like this. And in fact, the fake Goku surprised the spell even worked. More so that the other being isn't a Namekian at all. Despite these horrific turn of events, Oob remains confident in his abilities. He didn't think in a million years his fusion with Boo would be undone. So this fight will be tougher than ever, but also more exciting. He asks Kaiosama if he is able to figure anything out. Unfortunately, nothing yet. More unfortunately, he also thinks this is going to be something beyond his scope. With this, Oob decides he has no other choice. He's going to have to risk it. But he's not thinking about using. He is. It's his only option to get back on his level. King Kai Bell is the typical, I forbid you to use the thing that I taught you stuff. Because at the time, Oob was merged with Majin Buu. Now his body is too inexperienced to handle it. He'll die if he proceeds. Not Goku smirks that his foe's power has diminished a lot. He's not a match anymore. Returning the smile, Oob questions if he really thinks so. It's actually great that he's so powerful and evil, because the Z Fighter has always wanted to use this technique in a fight. King Kai again warns him stuff. Using the Kaioken, Oob can only hope he connects on a hit that knocks his enemy unconscious. This will buy everyone a little time to find out more. Delivering a monstrous knee to the chin, Oob definitely has taken notice of the invader's insta-kill blast, but only notes it as weird thus far. While down, Oob failed to knock out his foe. Ever curious, he wonders how this Earthling is able to duplicate his power so quickly and without the need to transform. He must be forcing his body to externalize the entirety of his power. If he continues doing this long enough, it'll likely be too straining on his body. It's unlikely that Oob would put himself at such risk without something else up his sleeve, something that could end this fight quickly. The villain decides he must not neglect the situation and use all of his power. Oob himself is starting to feel the consequences of using the Kaioken. Kaiosama and Goku are right. The technique is exhausting, but he's not worried about it. He only wants to connect shots that require concentration. He has to strike at the perfect moment. Even in their current states, Piccolo comments how they're both absolute monsters. Oob has been wise to keep this to a melee battle. Anything else would undoubtedly destroy the planet. Kinkai warns if Oob keeps going, he'll surely die. It's not worth facing him today if it means certain doom. This will all be in vain. Or is it that with everything going on, Oob doesn't remember what he was told? Jumping back in time only a short bit, the deity contacted the warrior while he is visiting his native village. As Gohan was fighting, Kinkai alerted him of the most recent threat telling him to leave now and focus his mind on the way. He'll need to utilize the Kaioken for this one. The very technique he's been told time and time again to never use at his current level of experience. While the latter is true, the Earthling's union with Boo has not only given him a higher power and new techniques, but has also made his body more experienced. He shouldn't have too much difficulty, because according to King Kai's calculations, he should be able to overtake this fiend pretty fast. Meanwhile, Gohan can hold him off while he himself will do everything he can to find more info on this. In agreement, Oob has one final question. Just who is this guy? Whose evil key is he sensing? Kaio only mutters that he'll find out when he gets there, not having the heart to tell him it's Goku. 
but now that the young student's back in his original form, albeit a reincarnation of an extraordinary being, Uba is now merely an earthling. His body will begin to suffer the consequences of the Kaioken. Although he hasn't been able to find the opportunity he's been looking for, our hero is at least confident his ability to hold out given how much energy he has left. Words which would come back to bite him. During their tandem kick, Oob's left leg shattered under the pressure. The evildoer cackles that it looks like as far as the Earth's little savior goes. He knew it was only a matter of time before his body crumbled. It's impossible for anyone to bear so much power. Oob knows his leg may be shot, but he still has energy. Will he be able to do anything with it given his condition? Very well! It was a pleasure to meet you all! <laughs> I won't leave any trace of this miserable planet! I can't give up! I only need my hands! Kame! Kame! Gun riddance! Seat away his cloak and turban. Seventeen turns to Piccolo a bit confused. He inquires if he plans on going in there. He won't be able to do anything. It'll all be in vain. Which he knows. But if he's going to stop existing, he wants to go out fighting. Seventeen should go as fast as he can to try to get to Capsule Corp. If he's able to take Vegeta and any of the others with him, they can flee from this planet using one of the ships there. If he can manage this, they at least still have hope to defeat him in the future. 17! There's not much time left! Damn it! You're kidding me, right? Come to blow! Don't bother! After maiming Piccolo, the villain screams how stubborn of a kid Oob is. Sooner or later, his arms are going to yield, just like his leg did. Who knows that's true? He will never win like this. So he's going to have to risk everything or they will run out of chances. And he's not going to lose to this imposter. As his master, Son Goku, told him that he should be. The Earth's Defender! Triple Kaioken! What? Impossible! I'm sorry, Master Goku. He... he did it? Devastatingly, while able to fend off the blast, the threat is more dire than ever. The Super Saiyan 5 was able to teleport to avoid the counterattack, otherwise he would have likely been done for. And with Oob completely drained, it's time to end this. But where'd he go now? Reston! His last strategy failing. It looks like Oob was planning to use the same technique he used against Pycon in the Otherworld Tournament. The one-inch punch that Goku himself taught him. It would have been a very fitting end. He admits he was a little too overconfident. He had him pegged as done. Though Oob forgot he could use his tail like an extra limb. <laughs> Continuing his wildcard MVP status, Seventeen comes out of nowhere and severs his tail. Which means... He can no longer access any form above Super Saiyan 3. He doesn't waste any time in scolding Piccolo. How is he supposed to take everyone to Capsule Corp if he never told him where he put them? Facing towards the android, our antagonist once again is curious how that guy managed to surprise him. Either way, he may not have any energy left himself, but he still has one more senzu bean. Piccolo warns his other world ally to act quickly. They can't allow him to eat that bean. But as he tries, something happens. The imposter's arm fails to respond. As he drops the senzu, a voice screams out he won't let him do it. Not just any voice. That was Goku, the real Goku. He tells Piccolo that Uba's dying. Please, quickly bring him that Senzu. Right. He tells our hero to do his best to chew and eat it. It'll heal him and recover his strength. Back to full health. 
Goku's able to greet a student properly for the first time since this all began, who exclaims how good it is to hear his voice. He finally broke free! But no, he can't do that. That's why he wants him to do him a favor. Oob must fire his most powerful attack at him. He has to completely destroy him. Though it's argued, he can just knock him out until they find another way. They have to. Protesting. Goku stresses he is not possessed by him. They are fused. Besides, he knows what this guy is planning and things could get even worse. He pleads to end this once and for all. He doesn't know how much longer he can resist. Again, he tells his master he can't kill him. The Saiyan reminds he'll be able to visit him in other world. So this is really just the means to an end. With the instant transmission, he can come and visit whenever he likes. Who realizes that's true? Goku asks if he gets it now. He will die, but it's not the end. They'll still be in contact. Years ago. Goku details his former exploits to his student. Specifically, the time he had to sacrifice himself against Raditz so Piccolo could deliver the final blow. Leading to the youngster to question, how does it feel to die? Is it sad? Taken aback, the teacher implores him not to worry about that. Doesn't he think it's even sadder to never live at all? And who could argue with that? Back in the present, Uba agrees. He'll do it, for the good of the Earth and for the good of his mentor. Who couldn't be prouder? Jumping back in time yet again, we go back to when Goku first arrived in the Dragon Realm. He inquires if Frugo said that he's immortal now. Which isn't exactly the case. Goku will now live on indefinitely, but he can still die from unnatural means. But that just means if that does happen, he'll just go to other world, right? Which is also no. Divine beings do not possess a soul. If he dies, he will not be part of any realm of existence anymore. He will simply cease to be. His body will vanish and his essence will fuse with the energy of the universe. Though he needn't worry about that. There's no danger here. Unless his body is completely destroyed, the only way to kill a divine being is with a dagger made from a special material, and that's nearly impossible to obtain. Thinking back on this, while he's deceiving a student, Goku knows this is the only way. It's been a great ride. Noticing the change in his demeanor, Oob asks if there's something wrong. But it's nothing. He once again pleads with Oob to do it already. trace of Goku. Oob sobs to know if Piccolo can sense his master's arrival in another world. Hmm. Oob. Teleporting to King Kai, he demands to know where Goku is. He apologizes. Goku never arrived in this world. He knows it's hard, but he has to understand. Darting away, Kaio beckons where he plans on going. Even with Elder and Kibito Kai, they sense no trace of Goku. This is a true tragedy. The former explains the Saiyan had no other choice but to lie to Oob in order to be destroyed by him and disappear along with the being who fused with him. Kibito Kai suggests that he must have had a much more important reason than the salvation of his planet to make such a decision. While this may be true, Elder's afraid they will never know his full reasoning. Meanwhile, on the dragon planet, a mysterious figure, presumably one of the gods Goku never got to meet, states that the seal of this universe has finally been broken. After all this time, it's connected with the divine world again. He questions Frugo if this means Goku doesn't exist anymore. Who clarifies that is indeed the case, naming this man as Lord Garrett. He tells of how there was no one capable of undoing this fusion, and the Saiyan knew it. He was aware of such a fact since his agreement with Shenron. 
so his only choice to save his world was by ridding them both from existence. Scouring Snakeway in denial. Oop cries it can't be! Goku is gone for good. Being left with more questions than answers, we still don't know what the force was which took over Goku's body. Was it Shenron himself, another god, or ethereal spirit, or something else entirely that we will never know? While this arc would naturally end with both Goku and his tormentor destroyed by Oob, what if things didn't have to be this way? While this would be my own canonical ending, or at least temporary stopping point for this series, Sibley had initially planned to continue with another arc to offer some backstory on this new villain. So let's jump back in time a few moments. I saw it! Vikandam, Divye Atetsu Preveto! Huh? As not one, but two entities split from Goku. The second we recognize from the very beginning of the story. The other, not so much. Piccolo frantically wonders who this guy is. The energy emitting from him is really weird. Perhaps he's a Kaioshin? Though offering no explanation, the mysterious figure is quick to teleport away. He must have fled Goku's body at the last moment to avoid dying with him. Had Oop not diverted his blast, it surely would have only served to have meaninglessly taken out Goku alone. At least there's one of the two still remaining here, so maybe they can press him for some answers to all this. Oop snaps back to the situation at hand and rushes over to Goku. Picking him up, Piccolo assures that he has no serious injuries. He merely needs to rest. That other guy, however, it looks like he might be dead. Stepping in for a closer look himself, Seventeen doesn't think so. He's not dead, just unconscious. Whatever the case may be, Piccolo finds it strange that he can't sense any energy coming from him. That's when the android beckons if his comrade plans on killing him. But if Goku's power was diminished while fused with the both of them, it's likely they're not a threat as they are now. However, they might have. Interrupting the statement, it looks like Boo has finally come too. He questions everyone what happened here. Before they get into all of that, which I'm sure would either take a ton of work or almost none at all to explain to the Majin, Piccolo requests he go help Goku recover. Which is easily done. Though the Saiyan pops his head not towards his allies, but to the mysterious stranger to his left. On being asked if he knows him, Goku claims he's never seen him before in his life. Piccolo informs that there was another one which had apparently fused with him, but he managed to escape. Figuring they won't be getting any answers alone, our hero inquires if Boo can go over and help him too. Though not everyone in the room thinks that's such a good idea. He could be just as bad if not worse than that other guy. But Goku doesn't think so. The short answer is he just feels he's a nice guy. Again, causing the Namekian a bit of bewilderment. So Goku can sense this being's intentions, but he himself can't even sense his key. Regardless of his apprehension, Boo is also easily able to bring him out of a slumber. While speaking, he stands to his feet facing the sky. Before simply uttering, he's got it. After a few more moments of quiet, Oob suggests to his mentor that since this guy's just been standing there gazing upward for a good minute now, perhaps he ought to say something to him. Before he can do so, the newcomer comments how he was just checking the most recent events that occurred here. He knows they have a lot of questions. He explains that his name is Antok, and that fiend that they let escape is called Pauk. Piccolo tries to figure out how he knew the other escaped if he was unconscious the whole time. And reading his thoughts, Antok tells how he can see the events of his current location. When they happened or whether he himself was physically present is not a factor. In other words, he can see through time. And a long time ago, when life was only beginning to flourish in this universe, he and Pauk fought a mysterious evil energy that destroyed all galaxies in its path. Unexpectedly, this energy would take a tangible form, making it much more powerful in the process. 
all would seem lost, and the universe would be destroyed before it ever had a chance to become what it has. When the god of this realm descended and sacrificed himself to save it. After this act of heroism, another divine being appeared to him. We learned previously that his name is Girit. He informed Antok himself that he would become the new god of this universe. However, this infuriated Pauk. He argued that he also fought in this battle. He risked just as much facing the evil energy. The divine being admits this is true, but there's too much selfishness in Pauk's heart. After this comment, the being would teleport Antok to the divine world, home to the gods of the twelve universes. Millions of years passed by. Life was shining once again, and Antok never heard a peep from Pauk. Then one day, suddenly an entire galaxy was completely destroyed. He knew in his heart it was Pauk's doing. It was his way of trying to prove his newfound might. On the Divine Planet, Antok demanded to know how Pauk managed to get here, and why did he destroy that galaxy? With a mocking expression, he explains that he's here, because he too is a divine being now. Though unlike him, nobody had to merely hand it over to him. He embarked on a quest which took him ages to complete. Alas, he has finally obtained the power of a god. Vanishing just as quickly as he arrived, Antok followed him. There were still many questions for him to answer. Upon furiously asking what's wrong with him, Pauk offers to give him another example of just how powerful he's become. Taking aim at another galaxy, his counterpart tries to appeal to a sense of reason. Is he really so obsessed with being a god that he's willing to cause so much destruction? This is the very thing they fought together against. He didn't used to be this way. Who only tells him to look at this? Going to physically stop him. The savior turned villain snarls that if his former friend wants it to go this way, he'll just have to destroy him before obliterating that galaxy. Despite his aggression, Antok remained optimistic in changing his mind. But Pauk warned that he better come at him with everything he's got. Because none of the other gods will come here to save him. He's unleashed a powerful spell to seal the bridge between this universe and the divine world. This must be what Fergo and Garrett were discussing when Goku perished. In that timeline, killing Pauk would have undone the spell. The two fought hard, but that battle was only a trap. He wanted to simply distract Antok to obtain a very powerful object. Still in the divine world, Fergo revealed to be a lowly minion of Pauk. He darted to a nearby cave to discover a mysterious item. Spotting it, he narrows his eyes and chuckles that his master will finally be the lord of the universe with this. Reaching out for it, a voice screams for him not to do it. Garrett would spring into action to prevent Fruga from going through with whatever he's planning, explaining that he has no idea the magnitude of its power. Pauk, through Frugo, was searching for the key of Taiji, the key that gives one access to the source of universal energy. Whoever possesses it would undoubtedly be able to become the most powerful being in existence. The minion had shouted for his imposer to be gone. This key is his last resort. Your warns this object brings not life, but death. Does he really believe his so-called master will fulfill what he has promised him? Surprisingly, Garrett was able to convince Frugo to give him the key to keep us safe from Pauk's villainous intentions. He told Frugo to inform Pauk that he has completed his task. Meanwhile, Garrett would activate it himself, so if he were to try to access it now, he would be trapped for all eternity. Doing so immediately, their snare was set for the fiend. He screeched out that he has finally accessed the power which hides within the key of Taijin. Antok must now witness the power that even the gods themselves fear. Who pleads with him not to do it? He won't be able to control it and he'll put the entire universe at risk. Unfortunately, Garrett tried, but couldn't communicate his plan to Antok. He was unaware that Pauk had blocked the bridge between this realm and the Divine Realm. Since Antok didn't know of Frugo's betrayal and the plan to entrap their foe, he had no other choice but to put this threat into submission the only way he knew how. <laughs> Utilizing a very familiar technique, the only real difference between the evil containment wave that we know is that Antok used his own body as a container to seal Pauk's spirit within. 
It was only a temporary measure since he wouldn't be able to maintain this for long. He had to find a way to make a more powerful seal. He went to the planet Namek. There, a peaceful, good-hearted race had been born. On this world, he could manufacture a seal which could flourish for lifetimes to come. Though it would still be far from perfect, it would allow him to seal the villain within his own body indefinitely. But to do so, he himself would have to merge with one of their elders, giving up his life as he knew it. While beneficial to the universe in keeping it safe from Pauk, it would also benefit future Namekians and give birth to their warrior types, who could keep their planet safe specifically. And so eons passed. Eventually, it's presumed the spirit of Antok would be passed down through the Namekian bloodline. Whether in all its people or only a few is not known. Eventually, it manifests itself in Shenron, the Dragon of Earth. So when Goku fused with the dragon, he unknowingly also fused with Antok. Maybe it was returning to the Divine or Dragon Realm. Maybe it's for another reason altogether. But for some reason, this is the moment Pauk was able to break free from his seal, leading him to take over Goku. Alas, here is where the story would come to an end. At least for now. We're left to only wonder about the arrival of Bardock's brother, the true power of Antok and Pauk, and much, much more. <laughs>